So I have a, I have a message this, just as we were talking this afternoon um, from a school head teacher where one of his uh, girls, Islamic school actually, has just left Islam. Um, wrote to me saying, um, we are struggling, can you help? Um, somebody recommended you to do some counselling. So like this on a daily basis, I'm getting mm. messages nowadays. So it's a very hot topic. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to today's unscripted podcast uh, episode. I'm your host Salman Bhatt. We have a very special guest uh, with us today. But before I introduce him, just a reminder, uh, wherever you're watching this, YouTube, Facebook, um, if you're just listening to this on uh, wherever, we, wherever you get your podcast, Apple, Spotify, uh, Google Play, so all that kind of stuff, remember to hit the subscribe button. Uh, it really helps us and uh, also get involved uh, if you agree with something, disagree with something, have any questions, uh, let us know in the comments below. Uh, today's uh, guest, tonight's guest, is uh, someone I've known personally for uh, many years, mashallah, but uh, recently, in the last few uh, days, uh, I've been seeing his name pop up on my social media feeds and uh, WhatsApp and uh, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Uh, he's none other than Imam Ajwal Masroor. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah. You've been uh, getting into a bit of trouble recently, haven't you? Oh, trouble, really? I've been talking about. Uh... <laughs> You've been uh, so you're you on Friday. Um, you know, I got a lot of uh, messages uh, on, on a lot of different groups, WhatsApp groups, and so forth, talking about uh, something uh, you wrote uh, and something you spoke about on the mimbar as well. And mashallah, you you've provoked a lot of uh, introspection, a lot of discussion, and that is on the topic of uh, children leaving Islam. Yeah. So, um, just uh, in your own words, what 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 brought on uh, that uh, uh, that topic for you as a khatib, as an imam, and uh, as someone you know uh, writing things for people to discuss and and influence? Because of course, you know, there's always a a trade-off. You have to um, think. You know, is this something uh, whose potential harms are outweighed by the potential need? You know, uh, for people to talk about this stuff. So, just in your own words. So I can start by sharing with you without giving the name. I received a message this, just this afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's dated today, and it's from a head teacher of an Islamic school, where the head teacher has written to me saying one of my um, girls' school um, students um, has decided to leave Islam, mm -hmm. reject mm -hmm. Islam, and become atheist or agnostic, whatever she wants to be. Mm -hmm. and now this is not the first time. I'm dealing with at least three or four cases actively right now. Mm -hmm. I'm offering counselling and uh, re-education for some of our children about Islam and their experience. It's one of those experiences that sparked me into action. Um, one particular story where the girl said to me, my parents expect me to be a Muslim, but they've never given me a reason to be a Muslim. They brought me up in a Muslim family, feeding me halal food, making sure that I wear Pakistani clothes and attend all the events, mm. uh, family events and cultural events. But they've not given me an intellectual, a rational perspective to the faith. Mm. Um, and I've been speaking to this particular woman for a couple of months now. And I tell you, how some of her questions are very basic questions. Mm. But the fact that they were not answered when she was younger has not only left a vacuum in her heart, but it's left her traumatized. Unable to answer the same question when her friends at school were mocking her, mm. deriding her, ridiculing her. She didn't have an answer. Eventually she said, I'd given up. A mm. faith that could not have a rational response. How can I stand my ground in the school? So that's one thing. But my father's own personal account of or his fear that yeah. he often used to share with me, and I wrote about this, that in his travel he met a white English gentleman who was a retired army officer who told my father, Mr. Hussein, you're in this country, you're a foreigner, you'll remain a foreigner, you'll never accept our country as your home. In fact, we don't want you, <laughs> but we'll have all your children. Wow. And That's my father funny. said, what do you mean? Then the man said, we will have your children who leave your faith and your culture, and they'll embrace ours. Whatever that meant. And my father's fear and that man's prediction is becoming true every day around us. And those are the reasons. I've been thinking about writing and I thought I'd start by a khutbah mm. and then I saw the reaction so I wrote a massive piece which people have said it's like an essay but hey, yeah. it's life. <laughs> <laughs> well I'm not going to uh, criticize anyone for writing long pieces, that's, uh, that's a kind of, uh, that's our bread and but butter on Islam to see. I know you, but, it is. <laughs> uh, um, what kind of, I'm interested to um, look at the kind of statistics behind it, 
you know i know uh, you know nobody's really done maybe a proper scientific study but if, uh, i'm trying to get my head around the statistical significance of you know um this issue and i think maybe a lot of people internally that they might be thinking about that is this just you know a few one offs or like a percentage of young people we've heard kind of shocking statistics from different people doing surveys here and there what's your what's your um, kind of assessment of the situation I, I, it has to be anecdotal because there is mm. no um, there are no research or solid study done perhaps this is something that muslim community needs to do now yeah. all the yeah. organizations need to come together and do something substantial um, so one brother who spoke to me after my khutbah at West, the, the Westling Masjid, mm-hmm. um, he uh, came to me straight was after. Was that where it was? Over the oh, first yeah. uh, the speech I gave. Okay. He came up to me afterward and he said to me, Brother, can I give you uh, a verifying story from my family? I said, sure. Mm-hmm. He said, I have eight members in my family. And I'm very sad to tell you, six of them have left Islam. Subhanallah. Young people or? Brothers and sisters, yeah. his siblings mm-hmm. of all age group. And I said to him, um, how widespread is this he said within my cultural background and i wouldn't give his cultural background just to keep it anonymous he said within my cultural background i can tell you every other family member that i have would have mm. something like this in their own unit of family mm. one two members are leaving one scholar in my encounter and again i will name him he said if you can save one children out of the three that you have into islam you should consider yourself lucky Spanish. and blessed especially living in a country and a civilization where you are, mm. where materialism, secularism, anti-God or godlessness is very normal. Yeah. Um, it, wor- it worries me. I've got two kids of my own and I have my debates and discussions with them on mm. a daily basis. And I see where their minds wandering, how they are influenced and how they're thinking. Mm. And it's that daily battle I think we as parents are losing, sadly, and our elder generation lost. It's just by mere luck, if we believe in luck, but Allah's blessings mm. indeed. That we, some of us have stayed in our faith. But that gamble was too much of a gamble. So in your um, khutbah, in your article, um, you highlighted a few, uh, I think several reasons in your in your experience. Um, you mentioned, for example, bad parenting. Uh, you mentioned um, stisses in particular, feeling, uh, you know, um, sexism and misogyny. Um what kind of numbers are we looking at here? I mean, do, do you think, do you see any patterns? I do. Larger number of sisters leave Islam than the brothers mm-hmm. from my experience of families that I deal with and the counselling that I offer. And the agnosticism, scepticism and departure from Islam is happening from our sisters in the larger number because I believe of our own personal failures. A quick example, mm-hmm. you go to the mosque. Our sisters have a space if they're fortunate to have a space in the mosque in a space that is miles away from anywhere near an imam. Mm -hmm. All the brothers pray behind the imam, straight after they have access to the imam, they can ask questions. They can get their doubts, skepticisms clarified. Mm -hmm. What do the sisters get? If they are lucky to have a space in a mosque, they may have to make an appointment and wait for hours before the imam is available or it's ready or their slot. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a negligent. So that is negligence at its worst, right? At the time of Rasulullah, this was not the case. He would be in front, of course, man and woman, both could come to the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam any time of the day and perhaps not the night because, of course, there was time when they need to rest, but they could ask him questions and learn from it. Number one. Number two, you and I are in a very fortunate position. Most of our masajids in London, alhamdulillah, do provide space for sisters. But if you go up and down this country, our country in the UK, majority of the masajids don't provide space for sisters. Do you see a correlation then? So in those areas where there are, there's a death of provision for sisters, do you see more sisters who are... I haven't done the research in mm-hmm. those areas, but I can... Uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know this, know the connection. Mm-hmm. I remained a good Muslim because of the mosque nearby, Islam and Masjid. Mm-hmm. I grew up in that masjid. That mosque has my blood and sweat. It, every brick and mortar that I can remember played there. Mm-hmm. I did everything that you can think of. I grew up in a mosque. It's integral to building your confidence and identity as a Muslim. Would you and say? character. Yeah. And your personality. Our sisters are deprived of that space. In mm. spaces, I went to America a few years back. And I went to Imam Siraj Wahaj's mosque in Ajah. Brooklyn. Mm. And I, he told me, my girls in this mosque, they grew up in my mosque. 
They come here, they play in my mosque, but I am their youth worker. I'm their imam, I'm their dad, I'm their supervisor. They do everything in front of me. And I was very mm. inspired by that. Where is that for us in the UK? Mm. We, I was talking to somebody today, a sister today. She said to me, I come from a mosque in particular school of thought background. In our school of thought, our imams have said we are not allowed in the mosque. Mm. Now, look, sisters are being deprived <clears throat> of mosque space, education, access to the scholars. Then you have got the cultural barriers, misogyny discrimination, two rules, one rule for mm. boys, one rule for girls. I'm sorry, it doesn't leave our sisters much of a good taste when it comes to Islam. They mm. are blaming Islam for it without really studying it themselves. But mm. do you blame them for not really wanting to take any interest when they see the examples of rotten in, around them? Good examples are not spoken about. But they do exist. Mm. But the bad examples are the ones that stay. It's natural. You have people have a negativity bias, you know. Of it's just why that's why anyone, any time you you see a review for a restaurant or whatever, anything, you're more likely to see the negative ones because you know if you have a good experience, they say you're twenty times less likely to tell some about it. If you have a bad experience, then it sticks with you, you know. So it's not just the misogyny and the sisters' mm -hmm. inabilities to connect, or sisters being prevented from connecting. It's also but par bad parenting, as I as you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. I wrote about that. Look in my family. When I'm growing up, who was my role model? My parents. My father significantly. Alhamdulillah, he was an imam. Mm -hmm. So I learned huge amounts from him. My father said to me, I carried you on my shoulder. East London Mosque again. When this mosque was in 1976, didn't exist. It was a porter cabin. They held a fundraising dinner, a fundraising event outside on the street. My father carried me from our house down in East London, the other side of the commercial road, in the thick of uh, rain. He brought me here so that I could stand on the stage and impress people by the Islamic teachings I was getting from the mosque itself. Awesome. My father carried me to every event that happened around with scholars. I'm indebted to my father for that. May Allah have mercy on his soul. He passed away. Amen. But I'm saying something. Bad parenting starts when parents are not there for parent, uh, children. Yeah. If you don't practice <coughs> Islam, if you don't know Islam, if you can't answer questions, imagine you are, a, uh, you are going to, I don't know, Oxford studying philosophy. And your father has been a manual worker. You come home and you ask him complicated questions and he can't answer it. You don't get much inspiration from such a space. If as a father you can't answer it, get somebody who can answer. Yeah, Take okay. your son and your daughter to a, a class. There are so many amazing scholars around who can answer them. So bad parenting, terrible cultural mix-up with religious uh, uh, practices, plus yeah. misogyny, plus in access or inaccessibility for our sisters to the mosque. All of those really contributed to more sisters living Islam in my mm. experience than um, boys. One of the on one of the WhatsApp groups, um, some okay. brothers and some du'at were actually um, uh, discussing this, and they one of them said that it's a very important kind of a list that you gave of of the different kind of uh, patterns that you saw, but some of them they appeared to be. They said, "What if these are just symptoms?" And we're not looking at the root causes, you know, what causes someone to be a, um, uh, or, or, or to parent, don't like the word, but parent badly. Um, and some suggested, for example, it could be just, um, and, and this might, you know, be influenced by your own politics and stuff as well. But they, they were saying, for example, um, economics, right? If, if the parents are, both parents are busy at work, long hours, they come back exhausted, you know, they don't have that much time to tailor, you know, um, uh, the, the, the children's tarbiyah and give them the, the, the appropriate love and attention and so forth, right? Um, as our parents perhaps could have uh, given us, even though they worked hard, but, you know, um, or some, some of them said that, like you mentioned, one of the things was Islam feeling dull to some people, right? And one of the brothers said that this is actually a, a symptom of a broader societal trend where children and adults are continuously overstimulated every second of the day, right? Over-sexualized sometimes, over-stimulated, entertained, you know, to death. Um, and, now, and, and we've lost the ability to focus on something, to reflect on something, to do something maybe productive, if it doesn't give us that immediate dopamine hit, you know. Um, what, 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 what do you think? Do you, have you been thinking about, okay, some of the, the deeper causes behind these, these, these symptoms? Some of those social constructs that you just mentioned, they do exist, I understand, mm -hmm. and it's overstimulation that keeps our children wanting more and more. But that's the reality you're yeah. living with. 
they are being overstimulated. Your answer can't be, ah, I'm not going to do anything. They're just being overstimulated. Yeah. If you don't, but why are they being overstimulated? I'm, for coming, example, yeah, I'm, I'm coming for example, to it. For example, many parents might be so busy that they have to. They feel that they're just, you know, leaving the kids. They have to leave the kids in front of the TV or the social media network or the devices or whatever. I have a 14-year-old yeah. boy who is addicted to pornography right now. Hmm. And I asked him, "How did you get there?" Blunt, honest question. How did you get there? Because my parents gave me an iPad when I was younger. Yeah. And I had access galore. What would I do if I'm getting bored? Now I tell you, this is not abnormal. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, there is a, a lot of overstimulation, and I wish I could change that trend, but I can't. When I was younger, what kept me occupied was youth activities. We went to the Peak District, the mount, mountain mountain climbing. We went to potholing, caving. We did everything that you can think of, from skiing to skydiving. I have done every mm. single thing as a youth worker or as a youth <clears throat> monks, our Islamic groups. So from Istan and Mosque, we used to go together. Yeah. From different parts of the country, we'd meet in Snowdonia. We had activities upon activities, but those activities were structured. Mm. Nowadays, kids go for these things, but they're not structured. They don't come with terbiya. They don't come with the focus. And the, th- the fact that our parents are busy earning money, how much money do we need? You know, how much money do we really need? How many cars do you need in your drive? How many bedroom extension do you need? How much kitchen space do you need? I know a parent the other day spent 55,000 pounds on a brand new kitchen. Mm-hmm. And I said to that family when I heard it, I said, you should have spent no more than 10,000 pounds from an Ikea kitchen. And you should have given that <laughs> remaining 45,000 pounds to your local mosque for a youth center. Wow, and they looked at me and they said, what? I said, you should have given £45,000 to a youth centre. A youth centre could have run all its activities for an entire year, paying a full-time youth worker for £45,000 a year. Now, we've got our priorities wrong. We yeah. think overwork will bring us happiness. Extension will bring us joy. but will buy us love. My brothers and sisters, I've got bad news for you. All this money that you're accumulating when you die. My father died yeah. three years ago. We looked at his bank account. We found nothing. We looked at his wardrobe. We found only two shirts and two trousers. He mm. left nothing on this earth except his children. That is Sadaqah Jariya. You leave good mm. children on this earth, they'll make mm. dua for you. You leave a lot of money on this earth, they'll fight for it. So my suggestion <laughs> is, instead of wasting money, our parents, mm. all you need to do is once a week, only once a week, one hour with them, sit down. You don't have a book. I can give you books galore. Just read a chapter with them every time. Okay, forget the book. Pick up a hadith. Imam al know is 40 hadith. Mm-hmm. Just learn 40 hadith and put that 40 hadith in practice in your family. It's called tarbiya. As parents start practicing it, right? Mm-hmm. Don't stop lying as a parent. You lie. You smoke and you tell your children not to smoke. You watch too much television and you tell your children not to watch television. Do as I say, not as I do. Correct. <laughs> uh, parents are continuously on the telephone yeah. and they freak out when their children are on the phone. So children will mimic parents. So mm-hmm. you're right. Overstimulation and we can balance it. By bringing Islam, small dose, at a time at home, through practice, mm-hmm. through love. That's missing at the moment. Salam guys. Sorry to butt in. Eh? But if you're enjoying this podcast, please head over to islamtunnelc.com forward slash donate to help us make more. And if you're not enjoying it, head over anyway and help us make better ones. Those, men, those, those um, examples you mentioned, they all have one thing in common, I think. Um, you know, if the parents are busy working they want to get a new car a new kitchen all that kind of stuff and that um uh Ustad Osman Qureshi he wrote an article a few uh, I think last week we published it on how Muslims have absorbed neoliberalism right as a just a, a, a neoliberalism the, the 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 political philosophy that reduces human uh, interactions to um, material objects Not just material objects But competitors over scarce resources Yeah And I think that is, that's why That also pop, jumped into my head When you yeah, said That verse of the Quran I'lamu yeah. al-hayatu dunya wa lahun. Exactly that verse yeah. Was zina Absolutely spot on mm-hmm. and, and that's what that, That's what went into my head When you said um, you know, spending spend ten thousand pound in a kitchen and give forty five thousand pound to a youth youth center. Someone might think that the knee jerk reaction would be, but it's my money. I can, I earned it. And I want to get this with it and that with it. Um, that's because we don't regard other people's children as our children. 
That's As for right. our own children, we'd, we'd spend so much money. We'd, we'd, we'd move, you know, uh, mountains for our children. But what about the neighbor's children? What about other brothers and sisters, their kids? What can I do for them? And that really doesn't kind of uh, feature in our normal kind of balance sheet. Um, if 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 the he mentioned the example, if the local madrasa has issues, you know, the imam isn't trained enough or the tarbiyah is lacking, many Muslims are, our knee jerk reaction would be to take our kids out and get them the best private you know, school, private tuition, or send them to a further away madrasa. That's our automatic reaction. If I if I've got the means to do that. Let me save my children. But what about everyone else's kids? <laughs> it's called selfishness. The very bottom and the essence of capitalism yeah. is all about me. And I think not just that, we pay the imams peanuts. I wrote an article a few years back. If you pay, yeah. if you give uh, peanuts, you get monkeys in return. <laughs> and, uh, and it was directly to the mosque management. Yeah. Uh, and it's from my own experience. When my local mosque offered me a job and they said to me, we'll pay you a thousand pounds a month. Would you accept it? I said, on your bikes. <laughs> and I said to the... He said, that's how I should spend on my kitchen. <laughs> I said to the, the chair of the trust of that mosque, how much, uh, wh- where do you live? He goes, I live in this area. How much was mm. your house worth? He told me how much the house was worth. What car do you drive? Where do your children go for school? Private school. And you're giving me a thousand pounds a month? You don't think I have children? <laughs> you don't think I need, to, I need a home? Yeah. You know, we, I've got that completely wrong. Many of our great imams who learn from our institutions end up becoming chaplains in prisons in hospitals yeah. because the <clears> government <throat> is paying them a stable salary and or we, uber drivers or, or, or uber drivers sadly <laughs> i know many like that uber, yeah. uber drivers but your point about this materialistic or uh, becoming competitors in the uh, scarce resources that we have allah has mentioned that in the quran in surah zumar mm-hmm. it is a competition between yourselves for x y and z all material you're 150% right. If my child goes to a school and if another child is having a miserable time, my child will be affected no matter how many gadgets I buy for him, no, no matter how many labels, mm. shoes and uh, T-shirts he wears. We have to look at it as a holistic approach. So the way we can stop our children from leaving Islam is by presenting Islam properly by behaving as a good Muslim in our society, by having the right institutions, by having the mm. imams who can actually speak the language, who can be re- relevant, smart and sophisticated, who can actually carry the youth and their respect. We can have parents who can do their job well. I think everything needs to be connected mm. instead of this disconnected way that we are approaching most things as Muslims in this country or across Europe today. Mm. I'm thinking of ways to maybe... Um, the grander theories, you know, to, to link all of these things together to make it easy for people to, you know, offer them something that will remind them to kind of knock off all of these things. And um, I thought of one thing, I heard of one, one sheikh, he mentioned that, um, I won't mention the, the, the name of the sheikh, a scholar of the last century, a well-known scholar, he said, one of the reasons why ostensibly practicing and observant Muslims may leave Islam is because of, because they weren't, they didn't feel grateful for Islam in the first place. That gratitude for Islam. That maybe this is something, and, I, and, I, and I've always wondered, I've got four children now myself, alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Inshallah. And I'm always wondering what is the, what is the actual objective of, some, you know, tarbawi objectives that I want to get across. Because you can tell a child, Islam is good, be a good Muslim, blah, 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 blah. But these are kind of just cognitive things, like just pieces of information. How can we make it effective? How can we make it kind of transformational, right? Uh, um, and one of the things I thought was engineer stories, lessons, um, life kind of experiences to help them um, get acquire some kind of feeling. And one of these feelings, important feelings, in my opinion, is that feeling of, wow, oh, thank God I'm a Muslim. Yeah. I would go one step further. My wife does an exercise with my children mm. regularly. Tell me what are you grateful for? Yeah. Just tell me what are you grateful for today? What happened today? And we do this um, regularly. Called, it's called gratitude exercise. We have yeah. it at home. Um, That's the thing you, even in therapy now, isn't it? Of course. And yeah. th- this is in the Quran, in the, in the mm. verse of the Quran where Allah says, وَهَدَيْنَاهُ السَّبِيلِ إِمَّا شَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا You yeah. may, I have shown <laughs> you the path, you may 
or accept it? No, it's imma shakira. You may be grateful because gratitude is the mm-hmm. example or example exemplifies in gratitude the acceptance of guidance. Now we need to teach our children Islam first before they can become uh, grateful. The fact that they don't even know their mm-hmm. faith. How many of our children actually know their faith like you do? Mm-hmm. I doubt very few, and very few would know it well, well and confident. One of my primary objective when I was doing a lot of work with the young people it was that to create confident young Muslims if they're confident in their faith it's most likely that they will be confident and relevant to the society yeah. so it's about them having I asked one um, ag- agnostic Muslim girl what's the first revelation she goes what's that I said what's the first command of Islam she goes pray I said no <laughs> I said do you know how long it took the command for prayer to come down she goes how long I said 13, 14 long years. Huh? What's the first revelation then? Read. We need to give our children the... Mm. We need to get our children to feel proud of their faith. Proud of their faith because they have made a connection with it. They know the faith is based on rationale, based on reading, writing, research, thinking, reflection. They need to be proud of their faith and they can present it to the world around them. Mm-hmm. So if we can, Ikhla was mentioned twice in the first few. Absolutely, <laughs> read and write, Subhanallah, yeah. and the pen, yeah. the concept of pen. So the idea that our children already know, mm. I think it's a false uh, assurance for ourselves. Um, so we need to give them the knowledge, and we need to give them the knowledge with gratitude, so that they don't become arrogant mm. about themselves. Gratitude is probably the biggest um, healer of many ills. But before people get to the point of gratitude, they need to have knowledge. And currently, knowledge deficit is huge. One of the things that came to mind, though, when I heard this, um, and even now when you're talking, is how do you get someone to feel grateful for Islam? You know, and the statement of Umar came to mind about, um, you know, the one who, man lam ya'rif al jahiliya. The one who was good yeah. in, ja- in the ignorant time. No, no, the, uh, like um, what I fear is uh, for the one who doesn't uh, recognize or didn't know about jahiliya. Oh, okay. Because if you don't know about non-Islam, then you before know, you became yeah, yeah, Islam, you, you you take it for granted. And our right? children know more about non-Islam today. Yeah. So the, the imbalance here, and, and what I disagree slightly, mm-hmm. is that we are assuming that we are living in a Muslim society. We don't. You take your child, I don't know where they go, but they go to a conventional school. From the hours of 8 o'clock till 4 o'clock, they're being influenced and bombarded by secularism, agnosticism, atheism, every other ism except faith. Mm -hmm. They come home. As soon as they come home, parents are too busy. Mm -hmm. They're sitting in front of their television. Another four hours of indoctrination. So 8 hours plus for 12 hours a day, they're getting indoctrination on atheism, secularism, materialism. Yeah. And then they eat and they go to sleep. Where is the Islamic teaching coming into yeah. any of this? So I'm just worried that while we, te- we need to teach our children how to be grateful for being a Muslim, you are one step ahead. Some of those children are not even Muslims con- consciously. <clears throat> yeah. And I'm more interested in finding out how can I get them to be consciously Muslim so that they can be grateful for Islam. Dr. Yaqub Ahmed one of the previous guests, a historian, he mentioned a phrase that was really powerful. He said, our parents, or people who grew up in Muslim majority areas, they received Islam through osmosis. <laughs> they just absorbed it from uh, the culture around them. Uh, and they may not be the best people to advise how, how to go about raising children in you know, uh, this type of environment. We have to be very careful. I mean, and if they were uh, receiving yeah. Islam through osmosis in a very mixed up countries like Bangladesh and India and mm. Pakistan, where shirk and bid'ah and all the rest of the nonsense that goes on in the society is mm. assumed as Islam too, then you're giving the same to children. And the children are living in the West and thinking, this mumbo jumbo don't <laughs> make, make no sense to me. I'm really sorry, not interested in Islam. Yeah. I am more enlightened being secular. But that's what the children are receiving through osmosis. No, secular... Um, Tastes, norms, um, premises. I remember when I went to a Sakri meeting once. Um, Discover Islam. Uh, they 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 go to the local uh, and they asked me. I just went um, filling in for someone. And Sakri is basically uh, where 
a, a, a local kind of uh, obviously you body you know but the, just for the audience a local kind of uh, educational authority or something um, people come from different faiths and they determine what is the RE curriculum the religious, religious education curriculum and I'll ju- I just said had, uh, ha- you know let me have a look at this and just kind of out of interest I was flicking through you know what they do in year one year two key stage one key stage two and all that and the nature of RE is so boring for most teachers that they'll just copy the, you know the, the the syllabus from the local somewhere else basically and i was looking at it and and just the way things are presented yeah it's so there's such a an insidious kind of um agenda either cogn- consciously or just unconsciously at play so they'll, so they'll say for example you know sikhism here's what sikhs believe and do you know the five k's and here's what muslims do you know they face mecca and uh, you know, they wear hijabs and grow beards and stuff. And here's what humanists do. They believe in logic and rationale and science. <laughs> <laughs> and they believe that you shouldn't just believe things that you Great. you hear. And I was like, what? <laughs> Fantastic. And that was that it? was the syllabus, you know, for the whole of Hammersmith and Fulham. Right? <laughs> so there's a lot of Muslim kids there. Of course. Now, where are we in these... Granted, obviously, you know, Discovery Islam, they, they, they went there and, the, you know, the people were there. But... Do we know this is happening, you know, in our local authority? You say winning uh, uh, unconsciously, perhaps. Some of these efforts are conscious to secularize society, to make sure religion is not in any way, shape or form uh, at all associated with any influence. And so therefore, the more you can denigrate religion, the more you can ridicule it, and the more you can present the secular lifestyle as better, Mm. the more likely children will follow that path. And that's exactly what's happening with our children. Mm. When I say see a a child, right, walking along the road, and they they trip over, and the first thing they say is, ouch. I know <laughs> secularism has succeeded. <laughs> or I would teach my children to say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, or something to that. Astaghfirullah, bismillah, whatever. One of those. But no, ouch. Or when they, when they get older, swear words. Yeah. To me, it's from that very small example, you know, micro example to the macro example of lifestyle. When we see a disconnect between Islam and the reality in Muslim societies and families in mosques, In our day-to-day living, children don't find Islam attractive. And I am all about wanting to make Islam attractive to our children so they see sense in it. They Mm. see enlightenment in it. They see logic. They see reason. They see fun in it. And they are grateful for it. But you you know that many parents, because of the constraints of you know, economics or whatever thing, the situation, they're unable to give, uh, uh, they give that much time and, and, and attention to their kids. For for those people, would you, are you arguing for living in a bubble? No, Being I'm not. For, for I, going, let's go to a Muslim school or homeschool the kids? Or I'm not arguing for that. I'm mm-hmm. saying pay somebody who can come and do the job. You've got so much money, you're buying mm-hmm. iPhones every year. You've got so much money that you can extend your kitchen and pay 45 to 50,000 pounds for it. You can go to holiday every year. In fact, you can yeah. go to Hajj and Umrah every year. I know some families who do. No need to go to Hajj every year. I don't know why people do. Hajj has become like a Las Vegas holiday. Stuff for Allah, may Allah <laughs> forgive me for saying this. But you know, it's a terrible thing that's become a normal today. Mm-hmm. Don't do any of that. Pay a good teacher and create a good class in your local area where other children can come. There are poor families who can't afford it. Bring their children together. Invest in your imams. Invest in the teachers. When my son was sitting 11 plus exam, what did I do? I looked around for the best tutor who would make sure that my son can pass his exam. That's what we all do. For 11 plus exams, parents are willing to pay 50, 60 pounds an hour for as long as it takes. But when it comes to their imam paying them to teach their children Islam, they argue of over five pounds. You know, this is absolutely where the problem at yeah. the moment is. So if you have the money, invest in it. If you have the capacity to teach, teach them. Spend time. My wife and I decided to homeschool yeah. our children when they were born. Not to create a bubble. It's a bit early, isn't it? I know. But we did. <laughs> we did. Yeah. And we did that from the zero till about the age of 11. And we were very, very That's successful right. in our program. I'll tell you why. My wife took the lion's share of it. That's why it succeeded. If I had taken it, they would have failed. <laughs> Same so, here. We, we have school as well. I make, I make dua for yeah. my wife. She's yeah. done an amazing job. Uh-huh. But I'll tell you one thing. If it, wasn't for the, if it wasn't for the discipline, we're giving our own expertise through nurturing their fitrah, looking mm. at their best potential and bringing the best out of them. 
I don't think we would have, we would have succeeded in providing them a homeschooling yeah. environment. They would have been bored. Both of them are going to secondary school now. Alhamdulillah, they're doing well. There is no guarantee that they will remain on faith. We make dua for them all the time, that Allah keeps them to the faith. But as parents, we have a duty, an added duty. So if you're earning a lot of money, ask yourself this question. Or if you're too busy not having time with you for, your, for your children, what is it all for? Assalamualaikum guys, me again, reminding you to head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to keep the lights on on Islam21c. We pride ourselves on being independent and being funded by the grassroots community. What are you going to take? So that, that's your message to um, the parents who have the material means. Maybe they're on an upward kind of social mobility trajectory. They have the disposable income. They can help and uh, fund the local communities, get 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 youth services and, and, and empower the imams, get them trained and so forth. What's your message though for parents who simply can't afford that? Someone could say, well, actually, Ajmal, you could, you could, you know, homeschool your kids, but I've got bills to pay. I've got... You think I don't have bills to pay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Allah Akbar. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it's called tawakkul. But yeah. tawakkul is not that you don't tie your camel. I work very hard. I haven't had a full-time job for 20 years or longer. I work part-time or I work in contracts. I'm not in debt and I have not missed paying any, any of my bills. But I don't chase money. I don't give my time at the expense of my children. My children are the most important thing mm -hmm. in the world. As parents, wallahi, my brothers and sisters, if you invest in your children, Allah will fill your pockets with barakah. Small amount of money that you earn will go a long way. And I have experienced it on a daily basis. My dua, my dua to Allah. Ya Allah, make our life easy because we want our children and ourselves to be successful in this world and the hereafter. Amen. I've been struggling to get a house for myself to live. I'm renting. I've been renting for the last five, six years. It's difficult. It's very expensive. But you know, I tell you, Allah answers duas in amazing ways. Perhaps Allah saved me from the burden of buying a house when a recession is just around the corner. Yeah. Smart. Right? So yeah. I have to think smartly and not be preoccupied with the fears and anxieties of this world and material. They come and go. Mm -hmm. But if I invest in the well-being of my children, they will remain. Even when I'm gone, right? When they make dua, it's mustajab. Allah will accept their dua. So I am saying to everybody, even if you are poor, your children don't need much time from you. There is a story that was doing the internet round. I don't know whether you saw it. A young father, a young boy wanted some time from his father, but the father was very busy. Oh, I remember that, yeah. Constantly busy, constantly busy. <laughs> One day he came home and the son said to the father, Dad, how much, does he, how much do you earn? Father became very upset. Get away from me. Go upstairs and uh, uh, rest. And the mm. son went upstairs. After a while, the father realized he's been so rude. Came to the son and said, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have shouted. So the son said, Dad, come on, answer me. How much do you earn an hour? The father said, I earn 50 pounds an hour. So the son then said, Daddy, here is I earn 100 pounds an hour. Uh, uh, Daddy, here is 50 pounds. Can you give me a 50 pound and can I buy an hour from your time? And the father said, I didn't know what to say after that. Our children are running after us. So when they're younger, they are running after us, looking for attention from us. But when they're older, we are chasing them. And if you did not give attention to your children when they were younger, mm -hmm. when they are older and you are I'm unable to move around and you're looking for attention from them, they won't even look at you. I so brothers and a very old uncle saying that once. He said he he said it in Punjabi. <laughs> very eloquent, you know, when when you're when the child is small he's chasing his father, Baba 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 Abba Abba, you know, when the father's old, he's chasing his son, you know, when he when he needs uh, when the the kid's all grown up and And what uh, brings that togetherness mm -hmm. is your attention to them when they were younger. So, brothers and sisters, my, my deepest request to you would be that your children don't need much money. They don't need money for you, from you. They a, need lot of, a lot of fathers, the way they show love is to put in the extra overtime, the, to, to earn loads of money. Because in, their intention sometimes is, I want to give my kids you know, the best, whatever, you know, materials. You know what my daughter so said? Daddy, I'm happy with cheese and tomato sandwich. <laughs> I, I need your time here. I was going to say she's not vegan, is she? But cheese is no, okay. she's not. Cheese she's not, not vegan. Not. Yeah. But she said to me very nicely. She goes. Uh, she said, "I would like you to be awesome. here, then go and work so hard. Stay here. Whatever we have." I think we that have that's that's most kids. All kids will probably yes. want that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's what they would but say. I think parents, especially fathers, we sometimes feel that this is how to show love, but we need to show love how the kids interpret it. <laughs> 
not and necessarily if, how we want to and uh, if you give them money as a means of love or commodity mm-hmm. of love then that's how they will behave with their spouse and the mm-hmm. cycle will continue and we have to break it mm-hmm. and we don't want to lose our children to these things we want to keep them together all of that tarbi as you mentioned earlier begins at home from the day mm-hmm. they're born okay so that's the, the, the i think that's some good um, kind of messaging for the parents so to reflect over what's your message for now the duaat the scholars the imams in the community I think we should because not be arrogant they, about ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, we should not be arrogant about ourselves. We're not safe. We are not the saviors. We are not the we're not some sort of a holy man with holy sticks. We're not. We, we I when I look at our imams and our scholars and our duaat, I get the feeling that what we are chasing and often we see people chasing is celebrity status. They want to become famous, they want to be seen on television, they want to see on they want to have a YouTube following, Facebook following. um we all have and this they want to run islam to and see <laughs> they want to be everywhere but th- it, it, that's the wrong way mm-hmm. i remember one amazing scholar i don't know <coughs> whether you remember him dr jamal badwi <coughs> from mm. canada he came to the i met him once i hosted him at, at university very humble man oh, inshallah hum- one of the humblest men i've ever come across very so we humble. invited him to come to a a camp a muslim camp in mm. the middle Mid- Mid- midlands He came we picked him up from the airport we brought him to a, uh, a small room and we said to him sheikh wait here we'll be back as we are youth we left a half an hour later we remembered oh <laughs> came back and guess what i saw in the room there were no furniture nothing dr jamal badu had taken his jacket off put it on the floor and he was lying on one corner with his hand under his head and fast asleep mm-hmm. and i looked at him and i said my god that's called humility that's called true scholarship he's not looking for somebody to carry his bag somebody to mm. fan him somebody to say to him <laughs> sheikh this and sheikh that and maulana this and maulana that not interested mm. and the generation that he trained were a solid generation of people and i still remember those days so what we need is humility among scholars secondly we need scholars who are relevant who can speak yeah. the language who are smart <clears throat> who are educated you know attire is not important we have become fixated about the galabias the, the jalabias that you're wearing the kurta the abaya whatever you are wearing fixated about it the fixation about our looks that's not scholarship wisdom doesn't come because of your because of your clothes mm-hmm. and more importantly more importantly to, for for our brothers and sisters in the field of uh, da'wah look every prophet came to not just impart knowledge but they came to impart the wisdom allah had given them mm-hmm. in your da'wah what is wisdom what wisdom are you imparting carrying books like a donkey is very easy but giving wisdom is very difficult this was one of the the, the criticisms that some um, brothers in in on, on these whatsapp groups they mentioned that a lot of the the brothers who like to study and and um talab and so they become some of them they become bookworms and they just want to kind of study and study and study and and uh, increase knowledge from from um you know perhaps for things that aren't particularly applicable in their communities you know and maybe allah will ask them you know you were you were you were studying alfiyat ibn malik for example but there were people who didn't even know how to you know make dua properly or pray properly oh your neighborhood mm. people were dying yeah. out of hunger mm. there were people who were uh, drug misusing there were people who were addicted to alcohol sure. there were women who were beaten there were girls who were raped where were you studying complex philosophy it's not going to take us anywhere of course individually we need to study i agree mm. because we can't run on the empty but if our knowledge is not beneficial ilm nafi'a if it's not beneficial mm. what good is that knowledge beneficial for the collective well-being of society so it's very important that our knowledge is followed with action and if you're knowledgeable as us sallam said go and spread even if it's one word share it with other people and sharing it with wisdom with great examples is the command of the quran the issue of okay so with wisdom right um someone might have a lot of knowledge they they maybe they graduated from an islamic program or some or seminary or something but when they come to their communities they need to deal with things with emotional intelligence right because a lot of the issues that you mentioned uh for that are cited as causes for children young people leaving islam 
a lot of them are so heavily linked to emotions right someone was uh, received trauma bad parenting uh, misogyny abuse. Uh, abuse right um they felt out of place as a minority and and so forth and well the kid, the kid other kids were saying you know asked some questions didn't know the answers for and so forth um emotional intelligence is so important for a dai to know how to give da'wah properly to a particular person right or how to uh, advise a muslim how to deal with someone's issues you know if you sometimes if you give someone the the correct answer technically the correct answer you could ruin their life right someone for example um someone uh, someone asked me once is my job haram is my is my well i'm worried is my wealth haram you know i work in a restaurant and they do this this and that there and the, the you, we all know the technical answer that the textbook answer you're supposed to give but i remember our sheikh he said be very careful with these types of questions why because that person might have wiswas that person might have obsessive compulsive disorder ocd and they're just kind of going into the minutia and and getting and thinking about things that will cause them anxiety uh fear an excessive amount of fear and so forth so sometimes giving someone the right answer like someone says you know um if water doesn't go in the 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 elbow is my wudu valid uh you know there's a textbook answer but then you have to look at that person in particular is this person who's someone who's dripping like they've not repeated their wudu 50 times and they're obsessing about this because if i don't if my wudu is invalid then my salah is invalid then i'm not a muslim and then i'm kafir and then i'm going to hell fire forever i've seen somebody yeah. like that of course that that that's a genuine you know authentically kind of uh, known about uh, uh, a mental disorder right yes, and it's not something we have to uh, mental health disorder and it does OCD. stem from what you said Mm. I remember when to I was making wudu in the masjid and there was a brother who was keep kept on washing his hand kept on washing his mm. hand and I finished my wudu with you know a couple of minutes maximum and I stood there for five good minutes watching him after afterwards I went to say assalamu alaykum wa alaykum assalam oh brother ajman how are you I said alhamdulillah fine are you okay yes why are you washing your hand so many times because they're just making sure it's clean mm. so I spent about half an hour 45 minutes just chatting to him he suffers from ocd Yeah. And wudu OCD came from one lecture he heard how to perfect your wudu. <laughs> and he's perfecting yeah. his wudu at the expense of his own health. You're so right that the knowledge that we give, the wisdom that we give if it's not coupled with emotional intelligence, mm. if it's not coupled with wisdom, we could ruin someone's life. If a child comes to you, I remember one girl who went to the imam and said, "I can't make wudu." because I can't wash my feet I suffer from a problem with my feet the imam said well sorry you can't you have to wash your feet <laughs> so it's uh, one of the obligations of prayer and so she tried for a few weeks but her feet became Swamish. swollen rotten etc so she stopped praying i remember at 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 a workspace i was there as a consultant doing something and others came in complaining saying this girl doesn't pray she's a muslim blah 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 i said leave her alone So we started talking one day and I said to her how is it going and then she said to me I've got a question for you what's the question I've got a problem with my feet I can't wash it and I can't make wudu so I don't pray until I get home when I do a shower I dry my feet and then I pray all five together every day mm-hmm. I said that must be a very burden something to do she goes yes I said what would you like she goes I'd love to pray five times a day I said if I make it easy for you would it be would you pray she goes of course I would pray for the right price I said to her do you have a shower every morning she goes yes I said after shower what do you do she mm-hmm. goes I put my clothes on and then do you put your socks on yes I do you have wudu she goes oh, I'm sure I do because I've just made shower I said after that when you mm-hmm. need to make wudu don't need to wash your feet ever again until you take it off just wipe over it she goes what do you mean so I explained the entire concept of wiping over 10 years on I saw her at another program she said to me I've never missed my prayer mashallah So we really have to bring Islam and make Islam yeah. practical for people. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said facilitate things for people, make things easy for people, give them good news, don't make it difficult mm. for them. So And he would get angry, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when, when people, people will elongate their prayers yeah. or do this that and the other. But emotional intelligence coupled with counseling training. Mm. You know, therapeutic counseling isn't about you giving fatwa. 
It's about actually understanding and listening and giving them the space to be able to get, get rid of what's on their, in their heart, processing their trauma, etc. Mm. So I believe all our imams should also have a counseling a diploma with them. All our imams should have them. And if they're going to really counsel people face to face, they should have specific, uh, for example, if they want to be a trauma therapist, mm. bereavement therapist, marriage therapist, they should get specific training. And each of the imams should be known mm. for their specialization rather than um, the generic uh, imam title that they have and they know everything. That is a curse, I believe. So mm. we need to change that attitude. We need to train and specialize. And we need to invest in emotional intelligence counseling program mm. as part of our imam training program. Assalamualaikum guys, last reminder I promise, head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to help this movement get to the next level. So we have genuine high quality media articulating Islam in the 21st century and developing confident Muslims impacting the world for the better. But in today's day and age though, increasingly people are turning to um, the internet, to social media for answers to these, their questions and their issues. Right? And that's, that, that's leading to a whole other... Kind of Sheikh fish. Google generation, yeah, <laughs> Mufti, uh, Facebook, and uh, and it's so ir- irresistible sometimes. If you know the answer technically, you know the answer to a question, but it's so irresistible not to blurt out the answer, right? And we see this. Some people maybe who lack the, the emotional intelligence, they lack the knowledge, the wisdom to answer these questions. Uh, it's very difficult to put a lid on that because everyone and their dog, you know, has an opinion now. We don't need to put a lid on it. We need to flood the market with more authentic, intelligent, smart answers from our imams mm-hmm. and our shiuchs. If you drown, it's, it, this is a market ultimately. If you drown the market with good information, people will see it. Mm-hmm. And anyone who has got an iota of intelligence would know rubbish from that which is absolutely true and right. So I believe we're not doing enough. <clears throat> like you guys write on a regular basis, people ha- should have every imam writing regularly mm-hmm. so that the internet is wash with saturated absolutely <laughs> why not that's what market is about that's let, an interesting uh, l- let there be yeah. a free market for religion i say and let us flood that market with our products mm, mashallah. so do you have um ideas and that you take to for example the the darul looms the medina universities or whatever that maybe you should add this module to your curriculum maybe we, on a systemic i think kind we of should yeah we should i think we should all come together and have a discussion about that but a couple of topics that come to my mind immediately is learning about the contemporary philosophy that yeah. is in existence around us. So learning about secularism, learning about atheism, agnosticism, European philosophy and all of that. So there should be a module incorporated, yeah. not just the Islamic philosophy, because Islamic philosophy on its own, when compared with the Western philosophy, you can't answer it unless you know. So that's one. Secondly, uh, 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 Emotional intelligence should be part of it, but it should be more of an Islamic psychological ex- approach. Have you come across a great scholar called Malik Badri? Mm-hmm. He's an amazing psychologist from uh, Sudan. He wrote a book called uh, uh, Contentment. It's a superb book. It's about psychology. It's about human mind and emotion. Um, people like that. Great scholar. Alive, Contentment. Yeah. Alive still. And we should use him to develop a complete concept for all the ulamas to learn about Islamic psychology, counseling, about emotional intelligence, so that we know how to deal with people. Mm-hmm. Remember Surat, uh, what was, and it says, talaha wa jallaha wa I've forgotten which verse I'm mm-hmm. looking for. Um, mm-hmm. The successful soul is that which invests in goodness in it And unsuccessful are those who allow the, the evil to be invested in it Now, what's that? Mm-hmm. Investment in that nafs is psychology And we mm-hmm. miss that psychology in our uh, uh, Darul Ulooms or Imam training programs It must be an integral part of it mm-hmm. And, and, and the, third, the final one for all the imams should be, they should be sent out, not to become the imams, but the servants of the community first. Yeah. Take up a project, be an, a youth worker, be the, uh, I don't know, be, uh, go and serve in a soup kitchen. Uh, learn how to get your hands dirty oh, because, yeah. before you take the pulpit. Pulpit is a very addictive and a powerful space. <laughs> uh, an 18-year-old just graduated from Darul Ulum mm-hmm. has got a pulpit with a thousand people listening. What do you think is going to happen? 
Yeah, you got to get him serving some soup and beans to the homeless. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Just like all the yeah. priests do. You know, mm. priests have to go and serve in the community first before they get their priesthood. But mm. th- isn't that what Islam teaches us? Sayyidun Nas Khadimuhum. Best of man. <laughs> Whichever way, the best of man is the one who can yeah, serve them. Serving. Yeah. So that book was called Contentment, yeah? From it's called Contentment, if I remember correctly, or Contemplation, either way. Contemplation. Okay. Or contem- it's by Malik Badri. Malik Badri. He's okay. a Sudanese, Sudanese scholar, and he's uh, just a superb scholar, yeah. really. Mashallah. Um, uh, just, um, I know we're, 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 we're kind of uh, running out of time here, but um, I wanted to get your um, get the people to know about your own writings as well. You've got a... A uh, book that's uh, you published and one that's on the way. Well, I've published one on a, a marriage, and I mm-hmm. published one on about sex and relationship. And Maybe then, we should publish one on about this kind of stuff as well. Inshallah. <laughs> and the third one that's just come out of printers, yeah. um, it's on its way at the moment, coming from Turkey, where that's where I printed it. Um, it's called Ten Steps to Getting Married and Staying Married. Okay. Um, I've got. I'm it sensing a theme here. Yeah, of course, it's all about <laughs> marriage. <laughs> um, yeah. And. Um, I think part of the reasons why many people who fail in their marriage is because they don't know what it means to be married. Um, mm. And after seeing this for a long time, I've written several books on it. Make dua so you do, that, you've been doing counseling for a while, isn't it? About 15 years. Yeah. Um, I make dua that I have the intention of getting at least four more books out um, within the next year and a half. Um, I've finished three of them. I'm looking for a good editor. So if you know a very good editor... I'd be very happy to engage them. Okay. <laughs> and talk afterwards. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. But the reason why I say this, mm. I think we all need to exercise the concept of writing. When I was young, my younger mentors told me I was not a good writer. So I really got disappointed. In fact, I wrote one article. Isn't that kind of against the whole idea of being a mentor? <laughs> I know. So one of my mentors said, you write terribly, go and learn how to speak. So I, yeah. I became a speaker. But that wasn't very good. And at the age of 40, something happened. In Ramadan, I'm saying to my wife, I need to do something. My hand is saying I need to write. You can go ahead, write. So I wrote my first book on marriage at the age of 40. So last year? (laughs) Yeah, alhamdulillah. (laughs) Thank you. Um, And ever since then, I've been writing. And I know Mm. if you um, go on my Facebook page, you'll see long writing of all sorts of issues. But I think we need a lot more, more prolific writers We need fiction writers, we need storytellers, we need young children's writers, we need writers who address social issues, political issues. We need people who are really addressing the day-to-day issues of Muslim community, but not as a bubble, but amidst the wider society in which we live, uh, so that our books are relevant. You know what I don't call a book? If it's a verse of the Quran occupying one page, and another verse, another hadith, uh, another page, and you keep on seeing the repeat, but there is no writing. Mm-hmm. No commentary, no thought process, no engagement, no invitation for uh, a, a further reflection. I don't call them books. Yeah. I call them raz- lazy uh, publishing. Publishing uh, Books are written even, when people write their even, thoughts. Uh, even fiction, that's, that's a powerful one as well. Yeah. You know? uh, Sheikh Al-Mara Shukri, he, did, uh, he mentioned on a, on a podcast in the past, he said, we're an ummah of great stories, but very few storytellers. <laughs> very few storytellers. One of my greatest influence in my younger life was a guy called Naseem Hijazi, a Pakistani writer. Um, because I was studying in Bangladesh, uh, in the Islamic school, our books were available in Urdu. Yeah. So Naseem Hijazi was a fiction writer on Islamic history. Mm. I read all of his books. Mm-hmm. He was one of the most prolific influence when it comes to Islamic history. Where are they? Where is our mm. English, Islamic, fiction writers? We'll, we'll, get work, we'll, we'll start working that, inshallah. Well, I'm not. I'm only a factual <laughs> writer. But let's yeah. keep writing, inshallah. Wicked. Excellent. Well, I know you, you need to uh, get somewhere. And I'm very grateful. Um, a lot kind of lost track of the time. So that's usually a good sign. But uh, yeah, Jazakum for, um, for for coming. And uh, Jazakum khairan you for... Uh, watching at home if you're watching or listening uh, whatever you're doing uh, just a reminder if you like this podcast give it a like and a share um, get involved in the comments you know, if you agreed with something disagreed with something you want to refute one of us anytime then uh, you know we'll happily uh, uh, you know have a read inshallah um, also in a reminder just uh, wherever you're get your, getting your podcast give us some turn and see a subscribe 
you know, hit the bell notification to get the be at the front of the queue. Uh, we're on um, wherever you get the podcast. You Apple, like your Spotify. subscription a lot. You keep on t- yeah, telling me to subscribe. Well, I, because they keep telling me you for, you forgot to tell them to subscribe, <laughs> so I need to keep uh, telling you to subscribe. Uh, and I also noticed that there's a, statistically there's a lot of people who are just freeloaders who are watching without subscribing. So the the YouTube Is this, whatever they're telling you. Did this go out that. live? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that out. <laughs> well, th- you know, thankfully you didn't say anything too dodgy, so we don't have to cut anything out. But no, it wasn't live. But uh, yeah, Zakma uh, Khairan for watching. I don't trust myself to go out live. By the way, I'm way. grateful. I'm grateful for your yeah. time. Alhamdulillah. And I do hope that people do take notice of the issue that's been raised, and that is our children mm-hmm. are leaving Islam. Mm-hmm. And if you live in delusion that they're not, wake up and smell the coffee. They are. Do something about it. Well, there you go. On that bombshell, folks. Zakma khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh.